Good morning, church family. It is great to be here, and it's always so great to see everyone out this morning. It's uh, about time to get started in our Bible class. We want to have a word of prayer, and then we want to get into the study of the book of 2 Corinthians. And I'm going to ask Brother Jerry, if he would, to come and lead us in a prayer, and then we will go ahead and get started. Uh, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. And we thank you for all the many blessings that you give us every day. Be with the people in Ukraine and help them through this difficult time. Combat is a terrible thing. And I know I personally felt it myself being in the military. But I didn't go into a combat zone. Thank goodness. Please forgive us of our sins, Heavenly Father. And help us to forgive those who have transgressions against us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Appreciate that prayer so very much. Open your Bibles, if you will, to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We were finishing up chapter 12 last week, and so we want to uh, open our Bibles and look at chapter 12. We're looking at verses 20 and 21 before we get into chapter 13. And if you remember, the theme of chapter 12 was humility. And in the last section that we were looking at that actually begins in verse 14 and travels through to verse 21, there Paul is describing his love that he had for his brethren. And, and that which causes us to love our brethren regardless of the circumstances naturally is the attitude of humility. And what he's doing is once again he is expressing his humility through his love. Now, even though we are people who we are humble, and we are people who we love, and we are people who we trust God, that does not mean that we do not have concerns or what we might think of as fears. I think of the Apostle Paul earlier, if you remember back in chapter 11, as he was talking about all of the difficulties that he experienced. One of the things that he referred to was that which comes upon me daily, the care of all the church. Was Paul concerned when it came to the attitude and the relationship of the church, the spiritual relationship that they had with God? Yes, he was. And so there were some times or there were some fears that he had as he thought about the church, not just here at Corinth, but in many other places. And so what we were looking at, or what we were about to look at as we closed out this chapter, is Paul makes mention of three different fears that he has, beginning in verse 20 and going through verse 21. And the very first fear is division. Look at verse 20 with me. For I fear there's the word that we are talking about for i fear lest when i come i shall not find you such as i wish and that i shall be found by you such as you do not wish lest there be contentions jealousies outbursts of wrath selfish ambitions backbindings whisperings conceits and tumult tumults when you look at this, uh, all of these words that we just looked at, and there are eight of them that Paul made mention of, they all are connected to, or they, I guess you could say, undermine the foundation of unity. What was Paul's chief objective as he first began to write to the church at Corinth? If we were to go back to the very first letter, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, how does that book open up in verse 10? What is Paul begging and pleading for? Do you, let's go back and look at it. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You probably know it. 
probably many of you are, are muttering that verse under your breath. But you'll, if you'll look at verse 10, someone read it if you will. Look at what Paul is begging or beseeching for. Someone read that verse. Okay, Paul begins that passage with, I appeal to you. Some translations say, I, I plead with you. Others may say, I beg with you. What is it that he is appealing or begging or pleading for? If one word could be chosen, that they would be unified. Because when you continue on after verse 10, some of them were saying, well, I am of the church of Apollos. I, I follow Apollos. No, I follow Peter. No, I follow James. Then you've got these over here who are following Christ. And Paul is saying, look, don't be divided. And so Paul's chief objective as he writes 1 Corinthians and I would suggest 2 Corinthians is, is to create unity. And when you look at these eight different vices or characteristics that he made mention of, each one of them are like a, a torpedo. Uh, uh, I mean, just a bomb to the foundation of unity. I mean, you look at the very first one, contentions. That would refer to perhaps maybe quarrels or fights or arguments. Jealousies, that's self-explanatory. Outbursts of wrath. I mean, someone who's just flying off the handle at all times, at any time. Selfish ambitions, the right opposite of humility. Always thinking about number one, thinking about themselves. Backbitings, that, that's literally slander. Speaking a false testimony concerning someone else. Whisperings, that's gossip. Conceit, uh, conceit would be pride and arrogance. And then tumults would literally refer to rioting or fighting. Now each one of these, they will work to destroy the church of our Lord. Now, the problem is, is that Paul feared that some of these things were going to be there. Why? Because they already struggled with them. Hmm. It just seems almost incredible to think that there were these kind of attitudes within the body of Christ. But there were, or Paul wouldn't have made mention of it. Let me ask you a question. Do these attitudes sometimes exist within the body of Christ today? Be honest, they do. And if we allow them to exist there, what will it do to the church? It will destroy it. One of the things that I love about the church in and of itself, and I'm going to be more specific here, and one of the things that I love about the Lafayette Church of Christ is I love the unity I love to sit in the meeting with the good elders of this congregation and see their unity. Unity is what makes a body strong. And unity is what makes not only leadership strong, lead, uh, unity is what makes the entire congregation strong. We need it. And therefore, if any of these attitudes dwell within us as Christians, what do we need to do? As the Colossian writer would say in Colossians chapter 3, put off these things, put away from them. Literally, the, the Colossian writer, incidentally, is the same writer. He would say mortify. I like that word mortify. Put it to death. That's literally what it means. These things must be put to death or they will divide the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, Paul has a fear for divisions. There's a second thing that Paul fears, and I believe it's humiliation. In the very next verse, verse 21, he says, Lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you. Now the word humble there, we understand that it means to make low. But in this context, Paul is in, I mean, is he afraid of being humble? No, he's not. He wants to be humble. He expresses humility in his life. And so in the context of this Scripture right here, Paul is talking about humiliation. What could that humiliation have been? I have no idea. If you remember back in chapter 2, 
Paul made a very painful visit wherein they rejected what he taught. Uh, I mean, can you imagine the apostle of Jesus Christ who has the authority of Christ, the power, the approval of Christ, and yet being rejected before an entire congregation of people? Could you imagine how humiliating that, that could have been? I'm not certain. Maybe it was the sins that he had encouraged them to stop committing and they kept on committing. But whatever this humiliation was, look at what Paul said that it would cause them to do. I will mourn. And the word mourn there literally means to grieve, to cry. We understand the concept of grief. It literally means to, to bemoan the loss of something or someone in our lives. And so Paul was fearful of humiliation. But then third and finally, there was one more fear that Paul had. And I believe it was related to sexual misconduct. Look at the three things that he makes mention of. He says, For many who have sinned before and have not repented of uncleanness, fornication, and lewdness. Now, now look at these three things or these three items that Paul refers to. Number one, uncleanness. This is morally uncleanness. This is not talking about someone who hasn't washed their hands or someone who has not bathed in a while. The word uncleanness here refers to moral uncleanness. It literally refers to sexual sins if you dig down deep into this word. Then you've got the very plain word fornication, which comes from the Greek word pornea, which is the from the English word that we get the word pornography from. And you and I think about that word pornea from a biblical definition. It is literally referring to the sexual act that takes place between a man and a woman outside the marriage bond. That is the only place where that relationship can take place and God be pleased with it. Outside the marriage bond, it is considered to be a work of the flesh and is condemning as we read and study in the Bible. And so you've got fornication. And the last one he makes mention of there is lewdness. And lewdness, if you look this word up, it's often defined as the word debauchery. You know, if, if you are like me and you don't know what debauchery means, you've got to look up another word. And debauchery, uh, debauchery just simply refers to an excessive indulgence in sensual pleasures, which once again mainly includes sexual Sins. And so the last fear that Paul has is he is fearful of sexual misconduct. Now, now I want you to look. He's not fearful that they are going to commit it. But, but look at what he says. There are many who have sinned before. I think that has reference all the way back to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul made mention. Well, let's just go back there for just a moment. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and I want you to look beginning in verse 9, and look at what he says. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous, what's going to happen to the unrighteous? They are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, heaven is not going to be their, their home. Do not be deceived, neither look at the very first one on the list. Fornicators. What did Paul make mention of in 2 Corinthians chapter 12? We just looked at fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners. These individuals are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Now, on a bright note, such were some of you. So some of those individuals in 1 Corinthians we're committing these very acts, these very sinful acts, but thankfully they had come out. But the problem that you've got in verse 21 is that many of them had not. In fact, look at what it says. Many who have sinned before and have not what? You've not repented. In other words, these very sins that he makes mention of they have practiced. In other words, they practiced them in the past. And Paul is fearful that when he returns, as he is about to tell us in chapter 13, 
I'm going to come back for a third time. He is fearful that they are still going to be practicing these sins. And if they are, what do you think Paul's going to do? Well, he's not going to spare. Okay? He has been as kind and gentle as he possibly could throughout this letter. But there's going to come a point where when he returns, if they are still practicing these sins, then just as he withstood Peter to the face in Galatians chapter 2, what do you think he's going to do to these brethren? He is not going to spare them. In fact, the Bible plainly says in chapter 13 that he would not spare them, but rather, if you drop down to verse 10 of chapter 13, he said, I'm going to use sharpness. And the word sharpness there literally means harshness. Okay, And, and so those were the three fears that Paul had. Now, as we go into chapter 13, uh, we want to look at chapter 13. Again, we're trying to look at this as a book of comfort. We're trying to put, pull a word of comfort from each chapter. In looking at chapter 13, the way I want us to approach it is, is by, first of all, recognizing some key words that you see in this very short chapter, just 14 verses, okay? One of the words that I want you to see is found in verse 3. Look at it with me. It is the word proof, since you seek a proof of Christ. Do you see that word, okay? If you drop down to verse 5, you see the phrase or the word Test, okay? Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith, and then you've got the word test, okay? Now, you drop down to verse 7, and you have the word approved. Not that we should appear approved. Now, though, though those are different words in our English translation, they are all three coming from the same identical word. The only difference in these three words, in verse 3, it's used as a noun. In verse 5, it's used as a verb. And then in verse 7, it's used as an adjective. It all bears the same meaning. Here's another interesting thought. In verse 5, you have the word disqualified. Or in some translations, you might have the word reprobate. Do you see that? See the word I'm talking about? Okay, in verse 6, you've got the word disqualified or reprobate once again. And then you drop down to verse 7, and you've got the word disqualified or reprobate once again. Now, in a sense, you've got this same word, some six, in fact, the word disqualified or reprobate. Okay, let me explain it in this way. If I had a board up here, and I wrote out the word theist, T-H-E-I-S-T. And I were to say, what, what does the word theist mean to you? You would respond, well, it's talking about a belief in God, right? That, that's theism. We, we believe in God. If I were to take the simple letter A, the very first letter in our alphabet, and I put it in front of that word theist, what would it become? Atheist or atheism. Now, what does that letter A do? It negates the previous definition. It's not one who believes in God, but it's one who is against a belief in God. The, the English language and the Greek language are, are very similar. When you take a Greek word and you take the very first letter in the Greek alphabet, which is an alpha, which is similar to our A, when you put it in front of a word, it negates the definition, okay? And so when you see that word uh, dis, uh, disqualified or reprobate, it is the same word as test and prove and approved. It just has the letter alpha in front of it. And so you've got this one word that appears some six times right here in this passage. What, what does that word mean? It literally means to try to put to the test or to test the character of someone, okay? With that thought in mind, look back to verse 5. In verse 5, this verse begins with the word examine. Now, that is a different word from the other words that we have been looking at thus far. 
but it bears the same definition. It's what we might think of as a synonym, okay? It, is a, it has a synonymous meaning. It literally means to try or to test. And so you've got, in a fraction of just a few verses, Paul is stressing the idea of making sure that they prove themselves or they examine themselves. And I'm asking myself the question, why is Paul emphasizing the importance of proving or testing themselves? You drop down to verse 9 with me. Drop down to verse 9. And the second part of that verse, look at what Paul says. And this also we pray that you may be made what? What's the word he uses? Perfect in some translations or the word complete. Now the question is, what does that word perfect or complete mean in this context? Let's look at a passage of Scripture where you'll see this same identical word and see if we can get an understanding of what this word right here means. Go with me to the book of Matthew chapter 4 and verse 21. Let's go to Matthew chapter 4. In verse 21, someone read that passage with uh, for me, if you will. Matthew 4, 21. Okay, in this passage, you've got Jesus. He's calling His disciples... And the Bible says that he sees these brothers, James and John, and they're in the boat with their father. And what are they doing to their nets? They're mending them. What does that mean? They, they were repairing or they were fixing them. Why? They were broke. <laughs> right? I mean, you've got nets and you go fishing and you get a large enough fish in there. Or you get several fish. If you've ever done any kind of seining, uh, my dad used to do that when I was growing up and I got the opportunity to be a part of, a lot of times fish would tear the nets and therefore they needed to be mended. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, the Bible says, Brethren, if any of you be overtaken in a fall, you who are spiritual, what's the word that Paul uses? Do you remember? Restore such a one. So you look at the word mending and you look at the word restore and let's go back to this verse, okay? And I want you to look at the context of it and this we pray. In other words, Paul says, this is something that we are praying for. What are you praying for, Paul? That you may be made. Or in other words, that you may become what? Complete. That implies that when Paul writes this, were they complete? No. Now, remember the word complete, what does it mean? It means to mend or to restore. What is the problem with these brethren? They're broken. Okay? Why is it that they are broken? Well, how about because of the fact that many of them are still participating in sins that he had warned them to stop. What does sin do to us? It breaks us. It destroys us. You, you and I cannot allow sin to live and abide in our lives. Now, not only does it break us physically and, and spiritually and emotionally, what happens if we find ourselves on the day of judgment and sin is still in our lives? The wages of sin is what? It's death, Romans 6 and verse 23. And so these brethren are broken, number one, because of sin. But again, Paul has had to defend his apostleship from chapter 1 all the way to right here in chapter 13. We're even going to see him as this chapter opens up. He is having to once again defend himself. Now, why is he having to defend his apostleship? Because they are rejecting it. Now, in rejecting Paul as an authority... Who were they actually rejecting? They were rejecting Jesus Christ. So, their lives are filled with sin. They've rejected Paul. In essence, rejected Christ. 
they are beginning to give heed to many of the false apostles. Would you suggest that these people are broken and they need to be spiritually mended? And so, therefore, Paul is writing to them in this very last chapter as to be complete. But because of the very fact that when we become Christians, there's something that, that, that is very special that happens to us as children of God. You want to read about it? Go with me to the book of Colossians chapter 2. Go to Colossians chapter 2. And, and I want you to look at verses 9 and 10. Someone read it good and loud. Colossians 2 verses 9 and 10. Look at verse 9. In Him, that, that's talking about in Jesus Christ, dwells, exists all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In other words, the full power of deity is in none other than Jesus Christ. Now that's good. You want to know why? Because when you and I are in Him, what are we? We're complete. Okay? You see, in Christ Jesus, when you and I become children of God, we are complete. We are complete spiritually speaking. No longer are we lost in sin. All of our sins are completely taken away. White clean. Our slate is clean as if we had never committed sin before. Listen, it's not the very fact that you and I are becoming complete. This passage plainly teaches that when we are in Christ, we are complete. But when we allow sin to come into our lives, what happens? We don't have that completeness. I want completeness. It brings a great joy in my heart to know that I'm complete. Look at chapter 4 of Colossians in verse 12. Look at what it says. Someone read it. Colossians 4, 12. Look, you and I have the opportunity to stand perfect and complete in some of the will of God. That's not what it says. It, all of the will of God. That, that's what you and I have in Christ Jesus. Complete in all of the will of God. And that's why it's so important that, that you and I do exactly what Paul talks about in verse 5. Examine one another or examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. It's important. These brethren had reached a point to where they were no longer doing that. They were broken. And sadly, I'm afraid, they didn't even realize it. They didn't know it. You, you know... There are those, they say, who uh, they can become so calloused in an area that they get cut in that area and they don't even feel it. You know what I'm talking about? Can we become so calloused, spiritually speaking, that sin slips into our life? It takes root, beds down there, that we don't even know it. We've just become immune to it. It's part of our everyday life. Well, we can find ourselves in that position. We don't need to be there. We want to be complete. We, we want to be full, complete, uh, having everything that God would have us to have. And so, that is going to be the word that we're going to look at in, the, in, in, in this chapter, chapter 13. There are three sections or three paragraphs. That's the way we're going to look at it. Verses 1 through 6, Paul gives a very stern warning to the brethren as he is closing out this letter. But then verses 7 through 10, look at what he does. He edifies them. 
<laughs> you know, when I think about it, and, and then in verses 11 through 14, you've got these closing remarks. And as you and I look at the closing remarks, you're going to see once again how Paul is encouraging them. It kind of reminds me of what Paul told Timothy in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 2. He said, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, but don't stop there, Timothy. What's very important when you reprove, when you point out wrong, when you rebuke, when you tell them what they need to do to fix it? You need exhortation. You need encouragement. And Paul was one who practiced exactly what he preached in life. And so you're going to see that in this closing letter as Paul preaches. Let's begin, first of all, with the warning that Paul gives, and that can be found in verses 1 through 6. Now, note if you will, in verses 1 through 2, you've got evidence of this warning. Look at how it begins. This will be the third time I am coming to you. Now, if you think about it, the third time, the first time most likely Paul has in mind when the church began. We could go back to Acts chapter 18 and we can see where Paul comes to Corinth and he preaches and teaches, the church is established. And so that would have been Paul's first time, no doubt, to be there in Corinth. Possibly the second time that he had visited Corinth could be related to chapter 2. If you remember back in chapter 2 when we began to study this letter, Paul referred to a painful visit that he had made there to the city of Corinth, to the church at Corinth. And it was a very painful visit because of, number one, the way that they rejected him when he went there. That could have been the second visit. But note, if you will, right here that Paul is saying, I'm planning to come to you for a third time and I want you to note the look at the look at the sense of the language here. Look at the flavor of it. He says, I am coming to you. What comes to your mind when you think of the phrase, Behold, I am coming? I think of Revelation. Because you remember how Revelation uh, closes out. Behold, I am coming. And the Lord Jesus is saying, I am coming. And when Jesus comes back, there's going to be a great judgment. Paul opens chapter 13 with a, with a statement that, that is very similar to the coming of Jesus. And, and so in, in this short statement, this is the third time I'm coming. I have to ask myself the question, what kind of a coming was this going to be? It was going to be a coming of judgment. Because these people had rejected him. They would rejected his apostleship. They had rejected his teaching. And in essence, they were rejecting Jesus Christ. And so this is a promise that he is coming. And they needed to understand that this was going to be a judgment coming. A judgment visit. Look, if you will, at the statement that he makes next. He says, By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. You know, that that verse right there, or that quote, comes from the book of Deuteronomy chapter 15, I believe it is, or Deuteronomy chapter 19, I'm sorry. Deuteronomy chapter 19, beginning in verse 15 and going through verse 21. This is just a portion of that passage. And so what we need to do is think about the, the context of Deuteronomy chapter 19. If we were to go to back to Deuteronomy chapter 19, beginning looking at verse 15, and going through verse 21, there what Moses is doing or what God is doing is he is giving the proper procedure that must be followed if you are going to accuse someone of something. And in that proper procedure, it was required that you have two or more witnesses. That's why Paul says right here, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, Every word shall be established. Okay? So why does Paul remind them of that? Well, when we get down to verse 3, look at what they are accusing him of. You seek proof of Christ speaking in me. And so the accusation is, Paul, Jesus is not speaking through you. Paul, you don't have the approval of Jesus Christ. Was that true? No. 
You're talking about a blatant, false accusation. That, that's what they were doing to Paul. And Paul is reminding them of a biblical procedure that they had not followed. Someone said, well, wait a minute, David. This is an Old Testament passage. That's exactly right. When you and I look at the Old Testament, while we understand that today we live under the New Testament, the law of life in Christ Jesus, that we read about in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, I need to understand that there are some principles, some laws that God set in motion from the very beginning of time, and He deemed it necessary that they keep that laws regardless of the era of time under which they live. Right? For example, when you come to the New Testament and the people are talking to Jesus about marriage and divorce, what does Jesus do? Does He give them a new law? No. He goes all the way back to the very beginning. He says, have you not read? Well, where do we need to begin reading, Jesus? He who made them in the beginning. When it comes to marriage, it has always been God's plan that a man and a woman marry and that they don't part from one another. Now, Jesus gives the one exception there in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 9, but you get the point that I'm trying to make. And likewise, when it comes to two or three witnesses, that's not just a law in the Old Testament that they were to follow. When it comes to an accusation, God has always deemed it necessary that there be a law that is followed. Look at, look at the uh, book of Matthew chapter 18 with me. Let's go to Matthew uh, chapter 18. And uh, when you get to Matthew chapter 18, um, let's see. Oh, okay. Well, let's begin reading in verse 15. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 15. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, watch what it says, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be... Does that sound familiar? Sounds exactly like what we just read in Second. Corinthians, doesn't it? And if we were to go back to Deuteronomy chapter 19 and verse 15, you know what you'd see? The exact verse, okay? And, and so here is Jesus incorporating this law. Well, well, the, the new law had not been established yet. That, that's going to be the statement that some will make. Okay, let's go to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 19. Let's go to 1 Timothy Chapter 5, First Timothy, man, you're talking about way many, many years after the church has been established. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and in verse 19, read it. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except why? Oh, there it is right there. You see the point I'm making? There are some laws that God set in motion that he never intended to change. And, and even though these people are living under the New Testament era of time, they had violated a biblical principle. They were accusing Paul of something that was not true. And Paul was bas basically saying, you know, when I get there, I'm going to put your feet to the fire. I'm going to hold you to what the Bible says. Now, note if you will that you've got further evidence of this warning. Look at verse 2 at what he says. He says, I have told you before and foretell you as if I were present the second time. And so note if you will that this is not the first time that Paul had warned them. And he's just letting them know that look, if this is something that I've already warned you about and I'm, I'm having to continue to warn you about. And then, um, oh, was that the second one? Oh, Garvin says the first one, so let's keep going. <laughs> okay. And, and so you've got, you've got this promise that, uh, that he has already warned them. And then finally, note if you will, look at the last part of verse 2. What does he say? I will not spare. And so Paul gives them 
good evidence of this warning that he is presenting to them. Now, who were the recipients of this warning? Look at verse 2. Note if you will, he said, first of all, I write to those who have sinned before. Who was that? Who were the ones who had sinned before? Look at the phrase, sinned before, or who have sinned before. And back up into chapter 12 and verse 21. You see the same identical phrase. Who have sinned before. That is not just the same identical phrase. It's the same identical word. And so who is he talking about? Who is he talking about right here? Those people who had sinned before and they were continuing to sin. And look at who else. To all the rest. So in summation, who is he giving this warning to? Not just those who were sinning, but the rest of the congregation, because evidently, what were they doing? Well, they were just standing by. They were putting up with it. Much like what they had done in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. You remember when the man took his father's wife? Remember that? That son took his father's wife? And, and, and it was fine with them. You know, if that's what you want to do, just come on in here and we'll worship like. Nothing is wrong. They, they were very complacent. And so therefore, they were guilty of sin. And so therefore, Paul is giving this warning not to just those who were actually guilty of sin, but also to those who were not doing anything about it. Now, note if you will the purpose of this warning. What was the purpose of this warning? Or or why is it that Paul is giving them this warning? Look at verse 3. Since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me. Man, can you imagine that? They were seeking a proof that Christ was speaking in Paul. What else did he need to do? I mean, let me hit this right quick. He bore the signs of the apostle, didn't he? Yeah. Did he get his revelations from Jesus Christ? Yes, none other. Was he an individual who was led by the Spirit? Yes, without a doubt. Was he an individual who had the authority of Christ? Yes, without. Did he have the approval of Christ? Yes, yes, and yes. But what else did they want? That's where we're going to stop this morning. And we'll pick up Lord willing next week. By talking about Paul's response to this accusation. You have been a great class as you always are. And uh, there's going to be a very uh, brief intermission. And then following that intermission, there will be some announcements. And then we will get into our Sunday morning worship.
Good morning, church family. It is great to be here and so great to see all the smiling faces and to be able to stand up here and hear all of the uh, fellowship that's going on. It's just always a great joy and pleasure to get together and study God's Word and, and worship God as His people. And so we are so thankful for the presence of every person who is here with us this morning. If you are visiting with us, we want you to know that you are our most honored guest. We are so very thankful that you've chosen to come our way. And uh, we hope and pray that you'll come back and be with us any and every opportunity you may have. If you are visiting, there should be a visitor's card on the, on the back of the pew in front of you. And we ask if you wouldn't mind to fill out one of those cards and you can pass it to the inside aisle or you can put it in a collection plate. Uh, as it's passed around. Either way, we want to have a record of you being with us here this morning. I have several announcements that I need to make before we get into our worship service, and so listen carefully and bear with me, and if I leave anything out, be sure and, and let me know, and I will be more than happy to add them this evening when we make announcements. There are, are many who we want to remember in our prayers, want to continue to remember our good brother Latavius as he serves in the military. Continue to pray for him. Please continue to pray for all of those in Ukraine and the war that is going on there. Continue to remember our dear sister Sylvia Edwards as she struggles in her sickness. Remember, if you will, Angela McCauley. Uh, she had a biopsy last week and she is scheduled to have surgery on April the 19th. So let's remember her in our prayers. Remember Benton Fletcher as he has not been feeling good this past week. Also want to continue to remember Owen McWhorter, the one-year-old who is, uh, was in the hospital but is doing much better now. Remember, if you would, Sybil Clifton and Rita uh, Dyer as both of these ladies have cancer and these are the sisters of Wanda Thompson and Edna uh, Jones. And so let's remember them in our prayers, if you would. John Allen Walker was diagnosed with uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, this is the young son of a, a co-worker of Jesse T. Clay Gilreath is on hospice. Uh, this is Betty Gilreath's son. Uh, uh, Ella Giles, age 11, is having uh, painful hip and leg problems. Let's remember her in our prayers. Remember, if you would, Rocco and Deborah Pierce in your prayers as Rocco has cancer and should be having surgery soon. Uh, remember, if you will, Neil Florence is having health issues and then Kevin Britton. This is a cousin of Michael Dawson who is struggling with cancer. Continue to pray for our president, our nation, and our leaders, and, and all of those who are in need of our prayers. There is going to be a teen singing today, and it will be at the Ultawa Church of Christ, and that will uh, take place, I'm, I'm not certain what time is it, 2.30, and so we will be leaving following the morning service. If you'd like to be a part of that, as we gather up, and we will go and eat somewhere, and then we will go to the singing this afternoon. Don't forget about the Tuesday morning Bible class. If you'd like to come out and be a part of that as we study through the book of Proverbs, uh, that is at 10 a.m. on Tuesday mornings. The next meeting for our VBS will be Sunday, April the 17th. That's next Sunday following the evening worship service. There is a gospel meeting uh, that will be held at the Greens Lake Road Church of Christ, and it will take place April the 17th through the 21st. That will begin next Sunday, and details are posted on the bulletin board in the back. Uh, there's also a gospel meeting at the Ultawa Church of Christ, which will take place April the 24th through the 27th. And again, that information is on the bulletin board also. Uh, as far as youth activities, there's going to be an axe throwing hosted by the Teagues on April the 30th. And that's going to begin around 11 a.m. There is a sign-up sheet posted on the bulletin board for, uh, for the family and youth activities. 
And Jesse, since he is not here, told me that, that those who can throw the best, he's going to put an apple on his head and see if you can throw it. And so, if you miss the apple, he didn't say, no, I'm just kidding. But if he's watching, he got that, didn't he? But anyway, if you can go and be a part of that, I, I know that you will enjoy it. Um, don't forget that uh, Sister Diane will be posting announcements with the day and time of the next CPR and AED training class, uh, possibly sometime in May. And so be looking forward to that list being posted. The men's breakfast uh, will take place the first Saturday in May. And there are speakers that are needed for each one of those events. If you will, be sure to go back there and sign the list. Our summer series uh, here is going to begin on the June the 15th. And there are going to be some excellent speakers and some excellent topics that are going to be covered. That will be on Wednesday night, every Wednesday night, beginning June the 15th. And, and I think going through the month of August. And so please be praying for that and looking forward to it. The Alfred and Sue Thomas Fund to help the needy orphans and widows in Ukraine. Uh, if you would like to help with this good work, uh, please see the bulletin board for more details. Now, uh, there is an active digital parenting workshop that is going to take place at the Rossville Church of Christ, April the 24th and 25th. And so I'm going to post this, or no, it's already posted on the bulletin board. If you'd like to know more information about this, please be sure to look on the bulletin board. Now, leading us in our worship service this morning, Brother Curry will be leading us in our singing, opening prayer, Brother Frank Sintel. Closing prayer, Brother Lee Holloway, and scripture reading at the appropriate time will be Brother Brian Pittyjohn. There's nothing else. Let's lift our voices and sing praises to our Heavenly Father. First song this morning will be number 568, Savior, Teach Me. Following this song, we'll have a morning scripture reading. Good morning to everybody. The scripture reading this morning is going to come from the book of Isaiah, chapter 59, verses 1 and 2. The book is Isaiah, chapter 59, verses 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have he separated between you and your God, and your sins have he hid his face from you 
that he will not hear you. Psalm 4 prayer this morning will be Hear Me When I Call, number 215. Hear Me When I Call. Father, we thank you for every blessing you bless us with every day of our lives. Every day that we wake up, you give us so many blessings we cannot count. Thank you for them and pray that you'll help us to use them wisely. But Heavenly Father, for those spiritual blessings we have, we thank you especially for them. Thank you for the sacrifice that Jesus made on that cross. And for the church he purchased with his blood and help us to be true to that church. Help us to put you first in our lives. Help us to serve you every day of our lives the way it should help us to. Forgive us when we weak and fail you. Help us always to seek to, to do the best we can and to turn away from evil. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll bless this church of your people. Help us to work together in love. Help us to do what we can to encourage one another. Thank you for everything that each one does in your in your name. Thank you for the teachers of the classes, for everything done, for those that go out on Saturday mornings and knock on doors. 
We pray always, we give you the glory for all the good things that happen. Help us to do your will always. Bless your people all over the world. Bless those that in foreign countries and help us to lift up their hand if we have opportunity. For those that are suffering in Ukraine and other places, we pray that you will bless them. Bless your people there and bless all those that are suffering there. Help us to be of service to our fellow men. And Hail the Father, as we work and worship and serve you, we leave this place today and go out to serve you. Pray that you will bless us. Help us to help us not to give up, forget, give up, but always to serve you. Bless us, forgive us in Christ's name. Amen. A song for the prayers to prayers for taking in the Lord's Supper this morning will be number 709. 709, kiss midnight, and on all that proud. Yes, in life and long The Lord's Supper is a privilege that we have each first day of the week. And 
we come together to observe this feast. As Christians, we understand what uh, what it what it means. Uh, right across the front of this table, it says, "This do in remembrance of me." And we need to, to uh, just concentrate on what, uh, uh, what what this means to the Christian. Um, we know that sin entered into the world uh, right after the beginning of time in, in the in the garden. Uh, God never intended for us to be hopelessly lost. Uh, down through the years, uh, there were animal sacrifices that were commanded to be given, but they did not, the blood of, of those sacrifices did not take away sin. We think about when Jesus came into the world and grew up and began his his earthly ministry, uh, he and his disciples were participating in the uh, the Passover supper shortly before he was crucified, and he. He told his disciples, those that were so close to him, that one of the, one of those disciples would betray him. And we know when we read uh, in Matthew one of the accounts that uh, that Judas betrayed the Lord. He had a At a time that he asked his disciples to watch while he went and prayed after they had observed the Passover supper. And we know from from the Bible that uh, that all the, the soldiers came to uh, arrest him and take him. And he mentioned that he could have called Twelve legions of angels to come and and rescue him. Now, twelve legions translates to about seventy-two thousand angels that could have came and, uh, and delivered the Lord. But he said that he did this because to fulfill Scripture, because it had been uh, had been prophesied. We have that opportunity each week to remember what he went through for us. I want to read uh, a few verses from Matthew 27, beginning in verse 27. It says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to be crucified. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, they, him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall, and when he tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, 
they parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. It's hard for us as finite humans to try to comprehend what Jesus went through to be crucified. He took upon Himself our sins. Every sin that, that we've ever committed, He made it possible for us to have forgiveness of sin if we're willing to obey His, His, His gospel. Again, we come together this morning to remember His sacrifice for us. And sometimes we, we think, fact this was many years ago but uh, it was very re relevant for us today too because we all need forgiveness the Bible very plainly teaches us how to become Christian and it teaches us how to live and that's what the supper that we're about to observe is for put everything out of your mind except what Jesus went through And as you think of him nailed to the cross, his arms outstretched, nailed to that cross, it's hard for us to, really it's hard for us to comprehend. You can't, you can't understand the pain, the physical pain, the pain in his heart as he took on the, the sin of all the world but he did it because he loved us. And we now have that opportunity this morning. Uh, and as we think of these arms outstretched on the cross, remember, someday, those same arms will come around and welcome us home as Christians. Let's offer thanks for the bread. Our Father in heaven, we're so very thankful for this opportunity that we have this morning to partake of this bread that does remind us of the body of our Savior. And we ask that you would bless it and bless us as we partake of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give thanks for the fruit of the vine.
Our Father in heaven, again, we offer you our thanks for this, the fruit of the vine, as we remember the shed blood of Jesus who died for us. We ask your blessings on it and upon us in Jesus' name. Amen. Each first day of the week, aside from the, the Lord's Supper, we have an opportunity to give back to the Lord a portion of the blessings that He's given us. I want to read just a couple of verses from Second uh, Corinthians, talking about giving. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Let's offer thanks for our our blessings. Our Father in heaven, we come to you this morning knowing that all the blessings we have come from you. And as we have an opportunity to give this morning, may we do it cheerfully. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We'd like to remember the song of invitation. It'll be number 701, 701. Tomorrow may be too late. 
Now, if you would please stand as we sing this next song, number 585, Soldiers of Christ Arise. Soldiers of Christ Arise. Great to be here, and uh, as always, couldn't think of a better place in all the world to be than right here with the good folks of Lafayette Church of Christ, and we are so glad that you are able to be here with us this morning. You have spent time and preparation getting ready for a Bible study. You have befriended an individual, perhaps you have spent weeks, months, even years, and you have finally got the individual won over to the point to where they are willing to open God's Word and study the Bible with you. You've invited them into your home. You've shown them your hospitality, providing meals for them, shown them encouragement, and you have possibly made it through two studies. If you're following back to the Bible, You've made it through two studies, and now you're ready for the third and final lesson. You're ready for the close. When it comes to the close of any Bible study, what is it that we want more than anything? It's obedience, right? I mean, that, that is our goal. That, that's what we put our strength and our effort into, we, we prepare, we get ready, we do all the groundwork, everything that you and I do, it's ultimately to see that individual obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. And last week, what we talked about is we talked about the importance of persuading. You have been persuading this individual to obey the gospel, and now you are ready, you are at the close of that study, and you're trying to get them to obey the gospel. What is it that you and I need? What is it that we need to do if we are going to be successful in our effort? Now, let me preface this, this idea or this lesson text with, with this statement. When we teach an individual and they do not obey the gospel, 
do not take this lesson to think, well, we have failed. That is not the purpose of this lesson. Listen, any time that you and I put forth our best effort, it is the work of God and His labor is not in vain. It is worthy and God will remember our job is to teach. That's all that God expects of you and me. But you and I want that close. We want the individual that once they have seen the Gospel of Jesus Christ, we want them to obey. And so therefore, the design of this lesson is to help us to close in the sense to where in perhaps, maybe, and prayerfully, that individual will obey the Gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to talk about several different things that will help us in closing a Bible study. And I'm going to begin first of all at the top of the list by point number one, I need to make sure that I give a thorough presentation. When you and I think about the Bible, is it thorough? Is it complete? Does the Bible give us everything that we need when it comes to salvation? Absolutely. We could appeal to passage of Scripture like 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture, that's all of God's Word. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. When we read that passage, we cannot help but conclude that the Bible gives us everything that we need. It is a complete message. You have the Bible, you don't need anything else. Much like what the Apostle Peter would say in the book of 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, where he would say that God has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now, if God has given you and I all things that pertain to life, spiritual life, and all things that pertain to godliness. Tell me what else we need when it comes to the Bible. Well, there's silence in the room. Why is that? Because the Bible is all we need. The Bible is a complete, thorough instrument that tells me what I need to do to be saved. And likewise, when you and I are doing a Bible study, it does not matter what method you may be using. You may be using the Jewel Miller film strips. You may be using the OBS, Open Bible Study. Whatever method you may be using, we are not arguing the method. It needs to be thorough. That's one of the reasons why I love Back to the Bible. And that's one of the reasons that we have been pushing it. We recognize its thoroughness. This particular study that we have noticed, you remember we looked at Lesson 1, we looked at Lesson 2, we looked at Lesson 3. Lesson 1 begins with a Bible authority. And you know what I love about that? I mean, it almost just leaves no stone unturned. The second lesson that we looked at was all about the church, the church that you and I read about in the New Testament that vessel of salvation that we must be a part of if we desire to be saved, if we desire to have heaven as our home. And then the final lesson is all about salvation. I'm not saying that that study method is perfect, but folks, it has a good success rate. It is very thorough. But in any Bible study that you, you uh, participate in, we need to be those that we thoroughly cover all the subjects that we possibly can. Now, does that mean that when you do a Bible study, that every question is going to be answered? No, that, that is not your intent. In fact, if you're trying to do that, you will be unsuccessful in getting an individual to obey the Gospel. I mean, just stop and look at the example of conversions in the book of Acts. Each one of them, how long are they? Are they two, three, four chapters in length? No, they are very short and to the point. What happened? The Bible writer told them just exactly what they need to know, what they need to do, and that's exactly what they did. And so when you're trying to convert an individual, it doesn't have to be a long, drawn-out study. That's where it comes in the second part of the teaching. 
The Bible teaches us, you remember in Matthew chapter 28, that we are to go and we are to teach, we are to baptize, we are to make disciples. But the following principle is teaching them to observe all things. We need to teach them what they need to do to become a child of God. But the point I'm making here is that when we are closing, we need to make sure that we are thorough. We strive not to leave anything out that would cause them or hinder them from obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. The second thing that we need if we are going to close successfully is we need to establish a need. You stop and think about a salesman. A salesman is going to fall flat on his face if he does not express a need to the individual he's trying to sell the whatever he's trying to sell. I had a good friend who who used to sell insurance and he said that that's what he would focus on. He would number one be very thorough in in his presentation and then when he got to the end of his presentation he presented a need, a very serious need. And he said he loved to do he sold life insurance and he loved to sell to a husband and wife. Because what he would do is he would point out the fact that death is imminent. It's going to happen. And you never know when it's going to happen. And then he would look to the husband and he would say, you know, you're going to die. It could be today. What's she going to do? Is she taken care of? And so many times because he presented the need in that fashion, it would cause those individuals to buy the insurance policy. When you and I think about the Gospel, I don't want us to think about the fact that we are selling something. But what we are trying to do is we are sharing with people a product. The product of God. And we want them to recognize their need for it. What is the purpose of the Bible? To help us with our sin problem. You see, the the individual that you and I are studying with They must have a conviction. They must be convicted that they are a sinner. If you are not convicted that you are a sinner, then you are going to have no need whatsoever for the message that is found within this book. And so what you and I have to do is we have to produce that need within that individual. And the way that you do that, there are several passages of Scripture that we could appeal to. These are some of my favorite. In fact, these are the very verses that are covered in Back to the Bible. Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2. As Brian read for us earlier, Behold, the Lord's hand is not short that it cannot save, neither His ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your sins have separated you between you and your God. Your iniquities have hid His face from you that He will not hear. What is that passage of Scripture teaching us? It's teaching us that when sin comes into our lives, then it separates us from God. It puts us in a condition recognized as sinner and condemned before God. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Here's what you can do with those two passages of Scripture. You can point out, especially in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, after you point out in Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2, that sin separates us from God, then you can go to Romans 3 and verse 23 and say, all have sin. And let's say, for instance, this individual's name is George. Okay, You can look at George and you can say, George, the Bible says, all have sin. Does that include me? And you know what he's going to say? Yes. Does that include you? You know what he's going to have to say? Yes. What is it that has, when, what happens when we allow sin to come into our lives? Well, according to the passage we just looked at, it separates us from God. What have you done in bringing that simple statement out from God's Word? you have caused that individual to recognize that they are a sinner. And then once you convict them of the fact that they are a sinner, then you and I show them the cure, and it's none other than Jesus Christ Himself. At the same time, as we are approaching the end of the study, we need to remind them, remember these verses that teach us that we are guilty of sin? What happens if we find ourselves dying in sin? Romans 6 and verse 23. The wages of sin is what? It's none other than death. 
If you and I are going to be successful in any Bible study, we've got to establish a need. That individual must be convicted of the fact that he is guilty of sin and he must do something about it. In the third place, another need or essential when it comes to closing is you and I must have a conviction. What would we be without a conviction? I mean, you you stop and think about uh, 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 the need for a a conviction or you think about the, the importance of a conviction. Our mission is to persuade people, is it not? In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 11, there the Apostle Paul would say, Therefore we persuade men. Why? Knowing the terror of God. Paul understood what God was going to do to those individuals who were disobedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he made it his mission, he made it his goal, his aim in life to persuade people. That is our goal. But if you and I are going to be successful in persuading people to be obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ, there must be a conviction. You and I must be convicted of the faith that we have. We must be convicted of our salvation. You know that's something that we must do. I mean, you you stop and think about an individual who is a salesman. If that individual is not convicted of his product, how successful is he going to be in selling it? Well, he's not. And likewise, if you and I are not convicted about our salvation, how successful are we going to be in sharing it with others? I mean, the Bible has the power to convict, does it not? In the book of John chapter 16 and verse 8, Jesus said that He was going to send the Holy Spirit. And you know what the Holy Spirit would do? He would convict the world of sin. Now, brothers and sisters, it's not this right here, this book that I have in my hand, the one you have before me. Is this not the product of the Holy Spirit? It is. Therefore, tell me what the, what the purpose of the Bible is. Is it not to convict people of sin? It is. This book has the power to convict any and every person of sin. But you and I have to have conviction in what it says. For example, in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, there the Bible says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Look at that word evidence or think about that word evidence. Some translations have the word conviction there. And there is a reason for it. When you think about our faith, there must be a conviction I must believe in what the Bible teaches. And if I do not believe it, then folks, I'm not going to be successful in sharing it. You think about 1 Peter or 1 Corinthians chapter 4 in verse 13 where Paul would say, I believe, therefore I speak. Why is it that Paul preached the way he did? Why is it that Paul sacrificed the way he did? Why is it that Paul was willing to go to the ends of the earth, never giving up, even though it meant death, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? Was he not convicted in its great power? And you and I have to be convicted of it also. First John chapter 5 and verse 13, we can know that we have eternal life. It, it's not a guessing game. Now let me ask you something. If you go into a study and you don't have conviction, will those people see it? Will they know it? Yes. But if you do have conviction, will they see it? The attitudes that you and I bear in this life are attitudes that people will see when we go out into the world and we are trying to teach them. We must have conviction. In the next place, if we are going to be successful in closing, we must be enthusiastic. You recognize the importance of enthusiasm, don't you? I mean, you you take two salesmen selling the same product and they go to the same house and one has a monotone, good explanation of the product, but the other one is enthusiastic. Which one's going to make the sale? I mean, you can ask, 
bosses, individuals who are over salesmen, you can ask them, you know, if you had an employee to pick from, would you want them to be a hard worker? Yes, that, that's important. W would you want to be faithful? Yes, that, that's important. Would you want them to be knowledgeable? Yes. Would you want them to be enthusiastic over all of those? You know what they're going to pick? Enthusiasm. You can take an individual who is a brand new convert. I mean, an individual who's just been baptized into Jesus Christ and they can take back to the Bible or any Bible study and they can stumble and trip and fall through it and they'll be successful in the end. You want to know why? It's all because of enthusiasm. You can take two preachers, two Bible class teachers, having the same sermon, the same outline, the same material, the same Scriptures, and one just read it all and yet one be enthusiastic about it, and which one is going to be heeded? You, you understand which one. And brother and sister in Christ, when it comes to our salvation, we've got to be enthusiastic. I want you to look at an example with me as we think about the attitude of enthusiasm. I love the attitude of this Samaritan woman that we read about in the book of John the fourth chapter, verses 28 through 30. I want you to note that once, once this woman recognized who Jesus was, look at what the Bible says. The woman then left her water pot. In other words, she just dropped it right there. <coughs> went her way into the city and said to the men, Come and see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Let me ask you a question. If you were a fly on the wall, how do you think this woman made this statement? Come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? You think that's the way she said it? I, I see so much enthusiasm. Come and see a man. Let, let me tell you why you need to see this man. He's told me everything about my life. Come and see Him. And as a result of this enthusiasm, look at what the Bible says in verse 30. Then they went out of the city and came to Him. Drop down to verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of the city believed in Him. Now tell me why. Look at what the verse says. Because of the word of the woman who testified, He told me all that. I ever did. Do you think that this woman's enthusiasm affected those people in coming out to see Jesus? And not just coming out to see Jesus, but to believe, to be obedient? And not just that, but they begged Him to stay there for a couple of more days all because of enthusiasm. When you and I go into a Bible study, we need to have the enthusiasm and the conviction that even before we have the very first study, that this individual is going to be converted. I mean, that's in my mind. I don't talk about maybe they'll be converted. I mean, I'm already watching them go down into the water, rising up and beginning that new Christian life. That's the way that we have to look at it. Because if you think of it as failure, well, I'm going to teach this person but they're hard-headed. You know, they're probably not going to obey. They won't. I guarantee you. Because that attitude will come out in your study. But if you teach them and you go into that study with the attitude, man, I can't wait to the time to I get to say, are you ready to go to the church building? And you're already convicted. And folks, that conviction and that enthusiasm will go a long way. Number next, if you and I are going to be successful in closing, we need to eliminate objections. Now, brothers and sisters, there are going to be objections in every study. It does not matter who the individual is. There are going to be objections. You even see that in the teachings of the Bible. In Acts chapter 24 and verse 25, after Paul reasoned with Felix of righteousness and judgment to come, you remember what Felix said? Go thy way. When I have a convenient time, I'll call for it. Tell me what that is in one word, procrastination. 
<clears throat> in many studies that you have with individuals and in teaching them the gospel, there are going to be those who will procrastinate. I know, I know what it says, but I, I'm, I'm just, I'm not ready. I just don't want to do it right now. You're going to find people just like Agrippa. Almost you persuade me to become a Christian. You're going to have people who will find themselves, they're right there at the brink of obedience, but, but they're just not willing to obey. And, and so they're going to come up with these objections and reasons as to why they can't obey. How is it that you eliminate them? I want to suggest two ways. Number one, you eliminate them in the very beginning. Every study that Kelly and I do, or one that I do my, by myself, one of the very first things that I like to do is to take a notepad and lay it on the table. And I like to say, you know, if there are any questions that you have throughout this study, I want you to know that we're going to write them down right there on that notepad. And then when we get to the end of the study, if there are any of these questions that we have not answered, then we're going to take the time to answer them. You know what that has done for you right there? He has said to that person, I am important. I'm important enough to this individual that he is not going to allow me to leave this study with unanswered questions. Now, here's what I do. I never straightforward head on answer any of those questions on that list. I do it discreetly. If they have three or four questions in that first study, I take them home. And then the next week when I do the other study, the second study, I find a way to incorporate those questions in the study. You see what we did? You don't hit those questions head on. And not only that, you allow God's Word to answer those questions. And so when you get to the end of the study, those questions are really just blanks. They've already been answered by God's Word. But then again, sometimes when you get to the very close, you're going to do lesson number three, and the individual is going to say, well, you know, I, I don't want to obey the Gospel. And then they're going to come up with perhaps a reason, or they're going to come up with a question. And here's the way that you can head that off. You can say to them, let me ask you a question. If we can answer this question honestly from the Bible, is there anything else that will keep you from obeying the Gospel? Right now. And what have you done by that? You have taken away the opportunity that becomes a contest between the individual who is being taught and the individual who is teaching. It's not a battle back and forth of answering questions. Many times individuals will say, yes, if I can, this can be answered, then, then I will obey. But you and I have to do our very best to eliminate those objections to cause us to have a successful close. Then again, when you and I think about uh, how we're going to close, we need to use gentle persistence. There will be those who will, you'll get to the end of the study and they will have the attitude that they, they just don't want to. That they're not ready. Never is it our goal to force someone to obey the gospel. Okay? But it is our goal to recognize the urgency. Folks, when you're talking about salvation, that's not a plain game, is it? Because once an individual's life ends, is there any hope? Is there any opportunity? No. And so what you and I have to do is we have to be gentle in our approach. I mean, Jesus Himself would say in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 16 that we are to be wise as serpents, but what's the rest of that verse? What does it say? Harmless as doves. In other words, there has to be that attitude of gentleness. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 1, Paul appealed to the church there at Corinth with the meekness and the gentleness of Christ. Say so, uh, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, the Bible says, If any of you be overtaken of all, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one. Watch this. With the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. And so that attitude of meekness and gentleness must be in every single study. But at the same time, we have to be individuals that we are persistent. When Agrippa said to Paul, Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. Did Paul say, okay, well the study is over. No, do you remember what Paul said? I would to God, Agrippa, that not only you, 
but also all that hear me today would both almost and all together become such as I am, except for these bonds. Tell me what Paul is doing in that passage. He is gently persuading Agrippa. I don't know that if Agrippa ever became a New Testament Christian. But I know this, Paul didn't stop with the fact that he rejected it. And you and I can't either. We have to be those individuals that we gently persuade them in the most humble, sincere way that we possibly can. Because you never know if that might be the last time that you see an individual. I mean, it, it pains me when I sh share the Gospel with people. And I know you've been in the same boat. And they won't obey. And, and to watch them walk out the door. It's hard for me to go to sleep at night. Because I know their condition. And so therefore I gently persuade. And that's something that we all must do. And when we do these things, brothers and sisters, I'm not saying once again that this will be a guarantee. But it will help us to successfully close and it will help us to cause that individual to be obedient. You may be here tonight or this morning. I got my days and nights mixed up. You may be here this morning and you are not a child of God. We want to encourage you. We want to beg and plead with you. Please do just exactly that. Come believing that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Christ, the Son of God. Be baptized for the remission of sins. And you leave here this morning a child of the living God. Maybe you're here and you're already a child of God. Your life is not right. Maybe you've been away from the Lord. Maybe you haven't been the, the person that you know you need to be. Then come back today while you have the opportunity. If you need to respond to the Lord's invitation... Won't you come as we stand and sing? closing song this morning number 436 nearer still nearer after this we'll have our closing prayer
Our kind of Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that thou hast blessed us with. Father, we especially want to thank you for this opportunity that we've had to come together this morning to study thy word. May we take what has been taught here, said here this morning and go out and teach thy word to every creature, Father, and as you have told us, that you will give the increase. Father, be with those that were mentioned as being sick. Father, may they return to their much-wanted help and be back with us. Be with those that are in the hospitals. Be with the doctors and the nurses as they're caring for them. Father, be with all, all those that have lost loved ones. May they always look to thee for comfort. Be with the, those that are in our military that as they are overseas. Father, be with those that are in Ukraine that they may look to thee for guidance and support. Father, be with us in everything that we do. Forgive us our sins. Bring us back to the next point in time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.